Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for these opportunities that we have to be with one another, to study God's word, to sing hymns uh, to his name, to pray. We're thankful from, for that prayer from Brother Daryl, the songs led by Brother Terry, and we're thankful for that reading from Brother Mickey. We're continuing with the Minor Prophets, and uh, it's one of those things, some of the names are hard to pronounce. I pronounce it Habakkuk, but then I went online and tried to get it pronounced, and it pronounced it about five different ways for me. So that's the one I'm going to go with. But I'll tell you, if you go online, and sometimes it just messes you up. I listen to it about five different ways, so if I pronounce it different ways this evening, that's why, because I was trying to make sure I was pronouncing it correctly. But we will be in Habakkuk, and if you'll turn over there, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. Uh, he's an interesting minor prophet because he's, he's questioning God. And he's got some big questions for God. And these questions God is going to give an answer to. And I think that on occasion Habakkuk is actually surprised by the answers that he receives. But when you go through the book, I think it sets up really nicely. In chapter 1 we have some questions and some answers. In chapter 2 we do have some really straightforward answers. And in chapter 3 we have Habakkuk praying to God. Three chapters but full of lessons that we can certainly take and apply to our own lives. A lot of people struggle throughout their lives uh, with questions, and I don't think it's bad to have questions as long as we seek answers from God. And I think we have to understand that God is not always going to give us an answer, and actually that's one of the responses that is given to Habakkuk. He says, if I tell you what, I was go what I'm going to do, God talking to Habakkuk, if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't even believe me. And I think sometimes that applies to our lives. But in the time period of Habakkuk, uh, Judah is definitely having some issues. They're, they're turning away from God in many respects, and, and really they're, they're destined for captivity. As, as the Babylonians are going to come and take them away, and, and they're destined for that. And Habakkuk is seeing this transition of the people, that they are turning evil, that they are in this danger zone of turning away from God, and he is very concerned. We're not 100% sure necessarily on the date of the book, but it had to be before the Babylonians had come into complete power. And, and I think we see that in the text, as the text is leading us to Babylonia, uh, Babylonians becoming a, a powerhouse and, and, and a nation to be dealt with. But Habakkuk, his name means embrace. And uh, there's a lot of different things that we could look at and pursue in relation to the meaning of his name, but that's what his name means. But really, let's, let's get down to the text. Is, is Have you ever questioned God before? Surely you've asked some questions in your life, and Habakkuk is going to ask some questions as well. And some of his questions are going to be focused on, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in the world today? He has that question. What's going on? He says, I see all this evil. I see all these things that are going on. What are you doing, God? That's the question posed. You know, perhaps we would ask a similar question as we look around our nation. And not only is he asking that question, he goes a step further and he goes beyond. He says, not only, God, what are you doing, but why aren't you doing anything? As I look out in the world, I'm not seeing you intervene, God, and a lot of this evil, a lot of these bad things that are taking place. He has a lot of questions about the world around him. Why are you acting? Why are you not acting in these particular uh, situations? And he seeks God by asking him these questions. So let's get to some of these questions. We're going to read the first four verses here in Habakkuk. It says, the, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, the, it says, O Lord, in verse 2, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear, even cry out to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore a perverse judgment proceeds. When we look at Habakkuk, it's, it's not only a question that he is bringing before God, but it's almost a complaint. He's describing the situation and he's wondering why God is not intervening in the people that he's looking around. He said the people are not doing good things. And he says, I come to you, God, and I tell you that they're being violent. I tell you that they're disregarding the laws, that they're not paying attention to your laws, that they're violent, that they're plundering, that all this wickedness is happening. And he says, why aren't you doing anything? Why are you not doing anything? 
You know, Judah is, is really destined for captivity because they have turned away from God. But as he is looking at this, he, he's, he's really starting with a complaint to God. God, look at the evil. Look at the wickedness. Look at the violence. Look at their disregard for the law. Look at them turning away from you. And you sit and you don't do anything. Why, God, can you let this evil continue? Why, God, have you not responded to the wickedness? Why are you not doing things? Why are you not doing anything? How long will you wait, God, to respond? I see the violence. I see the disregard for your law. I see the injustice. And, and Habakkuk is struggling trying to harmonize this because he knows that God knows all of these things, that he can see what Judah is doing. He can see the people disregarding the law. He can see the violence. And he, he's, why are you not intervening? Look at all this wickedness. You know, you may have similar questions as Habakkuk. You know, you look out at our nation sometimes and you look at the things that they do. Sometimes we can look out at our nation and certainly we can see violence. We can see the disregard for the home. We can see disregard in relation to marriage. We can see disregard in respect to worship. We can see uh, injustice. We see such things as abortion. We see drugs, alcohol, we see all kinds of things all around our society and sometimes we might sit back just like Habakkuk and say, God, how long will you put up with such wickedness? You know, you think in terms of abortion that started out, you know, with this, but now there's people discussing that you could even kill a child after it's born. After it's born and it's, it's breathed its first breath, there's people debating now whether, whether you can kill that child even though it, it, it's out of the mother. I mean, we thought a long time ago it was wrong when you were doing it inside, but now they're discussing whether it's okay to do it outside the mother. We look around our society, we look at the wickedness, we look at the injustice, we look at all the things going around. Say, how long, God, will you put up with this? How long will you allow this? You know, Habakkuk is not the only one that asks these questions. As we go throughout the Bible, there's many prophets, many individuals in the Bible that ask similar questions. Jeremiah is one of those. In Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why those happy who deal so treacherously? Jeremiah is asking about the same question. He, said, he says, righteous are you, O God. I know that you're righteous. But he says, I want to talk to you about your judgments. Because he said, I look out into the world and I see the evil prospering. I see the wicked prospering. He's not the only one. When we turn over to Job, we have a similar uh, observation made in Job chapter 21 and verses 7 through 13. It says, Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Their descendants are established with them in their sight, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their uh, bull breeds without failure. Their cows calf without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the harp and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. A lot of people throughout time have had the same questions that Habakkuk has had. Habakkuk is saying, I'm looking out and I'm seeing these evil people. They're prospering. They're doing fine. And it doesn't seem like God that you are intervening doesn't seem like you're doing anything. You're just letting this injustice go on and on. You're just letting this wickedness go on and on. We find a similar observation that the psalmist makes in Psalm 94 and verse 3 about this idea of the wicked prospering. So Habakkuk asks his question. He lays forth his complaint to God. In fact, when you look at that first, those first few verses, he says the law is powerless. They're not even respecting the law anymore. The law says this, but they're doing that. You know, the law says not to kill, but they're killing anyways. The law says not to drink, but they're drinking anyways. They're taking total disregard for the law. And I just, you know, stop for a moment and I reflect on America and our country, and it seems like to me that our culture is shifting in relation to respect. Slowly but surely, teachers aren't respected as they once were. Slowly but surely, the law enforcement is not respected as they once were. You know, you wonder if this pattern continues, is if we will find ourselves in a very similar situation where Habakkuk's looking around. He says the law is powerless. People don't respect it. They don't view it as having any value. They just disregard it. They do whatever they want. They do what's right in their own eyes. 
Habakkuk's asking a question to God, and God is going to respond. God, why are you sitting there? Why are you letting all this wickedness happen day after day? I see all of it all around me. Will you not respond? How long will it take you? But God is going to respond. He is going to give an answer. Let's look in the chapter 1 of Habakkuk, verses 5 through 11. God is going to respond. He says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgments and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than, even, than evening wolves. Their uh, chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as an eagle that hastens to eat, and they come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind and gather captives like sand. They scoffed at kings and princes are scorned by them. They derive every stronghold and they heap up earth mounds and uh, seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses and commits offense. And they do this to the power of their God. You know, God gives an answer here. He says, you need to look out in the nation and watch. He says, you don't see exactly what I'm up to, but what I'm doing is I'm raising up the Chaldeans. Well, who are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, it, after verse 6, the Chaldeans, it's talking about the Babylonians. It gives you, through verse 7 through 11, it's giving you a description of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. How they are strong, how they are ruthless, how they have strong military stature, how they are powerful, how they are all-consuming, how they have disregard for kings and princes, that they just go from land to land and take it over. God has told Habakkuk his tool to discipline Judah. He has said, I am going to use the Chaldeans. I am going to use the Babylonians as a disciplinary tool against Judah. They have disregarded my law and my statutes for too long. They have turned a blind eye to what I have said, and I am going to use the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, as a tool to discipline them. You know, sometimes people don't believe what you're going to do. And, and God almost says, watch. Just look out and watch. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And he describes exactly what he is he's going to do. And if we think about that in our lives, if God des described everything that he was going to do prov providentially for us in our lives, we probably wouldn't believe him. If God told you where you were going to be in your Christian life two to five years from now, you might be surprised. At least when I look back on my life, I'm surprised. I started out subbing in for a gospel preacher who had cancer. And if you would have told me two years from then I'd be subbing in, I'd say, that's craziness. You know, I wouldn't have believed you. And then if you would have said two more years down the line, this is going to happen, and two more years down, yeah, I wouldn't have believed you. A lot of times when it comes to God's providence, he's not going to write it out for you and tell you exactly what's going to happen. You know why? Because even if he did, you wouldn't believe him. And Habakkuk is going to struggle with this. He's not going to believe to some degree. I think he understands what's going to happen. But he struggles with why God is going to use such a wicked nation to punish Judah. And we're going to see that in, in verses 12 and following. But if God told you everything that he was going to do in your life providentially, you wouldn't believe him. And Habakkuk is going to struggle with God's answer to Judah. He says, oh, Judah is going to be punished. They're going to be punished for their violence. They're going to be punished for their disregard of the law. They're going to be punished for their injustice. And the Chaldeans are going to be the tool. When we start looking at the description of the Chaldeans in verse 6, we see that they are a powerful and terrible nation. In verses 7 through 9, we see that they are strong and ruthless. And as we continue on, we just start to see this description of them. And once we get to uh, verses 12 and following, uh, Habakkuk does struggle with this. And we start to see him talking once again, and he starts talking with God, and he is confused on how God could use such a wicked nation as the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, 
to punish Judah. He struggles with this, and you're going to see it very clearly in these next few verses. Let's pick up in verse 12. It says, "You are you not from everlasting? He's talked to him about the Babylonians and how they're going to come. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You are marked them for correction. You are of pure eye, purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Now he starts out in verse 12 and he's acknowledging a lot of things about God. It's not that Habakkuk is being uh, totally disrespectful here. He's saying, God, I know you're everlasting. And God, I know that, that, that you have pure eyes. And, and God, I know that you can see the wicked things that are happening. And I know that you have marked Judah for correction. I know these things. But you start to see his struggle in verse 13. It says, you cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? What is he talking about there? He's struggling with the idea that you are going to use a wicked nation to punish Judah because the Babylonians are much more wicked than Judah. Yes, Judah has its problems. Yes, we've broken laws. Yes, we're not just. And and yes, we've made our mistakes. But how could you use the wicked to devour people that are better than them in the sense of they're living somewhat better lives? Not that they're living the best lives. They definitely have their problems. Verse 14, why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no rule over them? He's going to continue through these verses, and I really do think he's describing the the Babylonians there. But uh, he's confused. How are you going to use a nation that is more evil than Judah to punish Judah? And God says, I'm going to do it. That's my plan, is the Chaldeans are going to come in and they are going to punish Judah. They're going to come in and they're going to take them over. And when they're taken over, hopefully that will humble them and they will turn back to God. Habakkuk is struggling with this. He's struggling with this. And you know what? I think many of us might struggle with this if we were you know, looking at it in the context of America. If we, we said, you know, if, if Russia came in. You know, if Russia came in and just knocked out the United States or North Korea, if North Korea somehow could come in and knock out the United States or or China, some people might justify in their head, well, well, America, aren't we better off than some of these other... I mean, yes, we have our wickedness, but aren't we better? He's using this nation as a disciplinary tool against Judah. And Habakkuk is struggling with it. You know, he recognizes a lot of things about God, but, but he's confused. And if you remember, God said, if I tell you what I'm going to do, you're not going to understand it. And I think we almost see that with Habakkuk because he is struggling with this. Well, what is he struggling with? He is trying to harmonize a God of mercy and grace and a God of justice and punishment. He's trying to harmonize it, and he, he's struggling with this, and I think people struggle with this throughout their lives, and they ask similar questions that, to Habakkuk. How long, God, are you going to let this wickedness go on? But then when God deals with the wickedness, sometimes we question his methods. Well, why would you use a nation much more wicked to come in and deal with this problem? At the beginning of chapter 2, Habakkuk, after he lays this second complaint, this this second question before God, we see in verse 1, he says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Habakkuk says, I've laid my case. I've put my questions before God. He has given me an answer, and I am going to see what he is going to do. And in verses 2 through 3, God is going to reveal a vision of what's going to happen. And he's going to answer Habakkuk's second question, which his second question is, God, how could you use a nation that is more evil than Judah to punish Judah? God's going to answer that in chapter 2. And Habakkuk says, I'm waiting, God. I have laid my questions before you. I've laid my complaints before you. I am going to wait to see how you respond. Verses 2 and 3 in chapter 2. It says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, 
but the just shall live by faith. God says, I'm about to reveal a vision to you, Habakkuk, and I'm going to show you things that are going to happen. And he cautions Habakkuk in verses 3 and 4 to be patient. He said these things are going to happen. They're not going to happen immediately, but they are going to happen. And when they do happen, these things that you put on these tablets are not going to be a lie. And write these down so you can warn some individuals. We're not going to have time this evening to necessarily read the whole text. But as once you get past verse 4, what happens is we start to see this vision unfold. And really, when we start to look at this vision, it starts to talk about I believe the ba- Babylonian, some people also think it's in relation to Judah, but it doesn't matter because it's just talking about what a wicked nation looks like. It says, woe to the nation that does this. Woe to the nation that does this. Woe to the nation that does this. What's the vision about? Is a nation that goes away from God will be punished. And we start to see that in the vision unfold. In verse 5, we see that this nation cannot be satisfied. In verse 5, it says, Indeed, because of uh, he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home because he enlarges his desires as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. This, is, this really, when you think about the Babylonians, this is exactly what they did, is they would go from nation to nation. They were not satisfied. Once they took over a nation, they just kept on going. They kept taking over nation after nation after nation. And God is saying, woe to the nations that do such things. It's saying, woe to this nation that cannot be satisfied. This nation that goes on and on and cannot be satisfied. In verse 6, it says, it, we have another woe. It says, will, you, uh, will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Well, what's a pledge? A pledge is like a tribute. And what nations would do is they'd be so afraid of Babylon that they would say, Hey, we will pay you this much if you don't attack us. We will pay you this much. And and what the Bible is saying is that that is not right. And a nation that does that, that says, hey, we're going to hold back our attack as long as you give us this money, these pledges, I really think that God is describing Babylon. And it's very important that what is God saying in relation to the traits of Babylon? He's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, What is he talking about? He is warning them if Babylon continues in these practices, what's going to happen to them as well? They are going to be dealt with. See, Habakkuk struggling and saying, how can Babylon come in and discipline Judah? They are much more evil than Judah. How could God do that? And God says, I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. Is that I'm going to punish Judah, but not only am I going to punish Judah, but I'm going to punish a nation that conducts itself in this way. In verses 9 through 11, we see some more woes. It says, woe to the nation that cuts off other nations to be secure. What's that talking about? Is Babylon would get insecure about nations that were close to them, so what they would do is they'd just go and capture them. In verse 12, we have another woe to the nations. It says, woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed. Certainly that would be a description of the Babylonians, is that when they would go from place to place, they weren't trying to, they were just building towns on war by taking over places, killing individuals, a very brutal nation that dealt with people uh, with not much mercy or pity. In verses 18 through 20, it talks about the nation and it talks about them and their idolatry. It says, what profit, starting in verse 18, what profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies that the maker of its mold should trust in it. To make mute idols, woe to him who says to the wood, awake, to the silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all, but the Lord... In his holy temple, let all the earth keep silent before him. It says, woe to the nation that that worships idols. Woe to the nation that makes a carved image out of wood and says, hey, awake, here's our God. Woe to the nation that takes a rock and puts gold over it and says, oh, look at this rock. This rock is our God. All these woes, I believe, are in relation to Babylon. And I think what God is trying to tell Habakkuk is, yes, I'm going to use Babylon to punish Judah. But don't think that I don't see what Babylon is doing. 
Don't think that I don't see the bloodshed. Don't think I see all of the wickedness that they're doing. They will be punished as well. And he's giving a warning to any nation, I believe, that does these type of things. And Judah actually finds himself in the interesting predicament where they are doing some of these things, but I think that the Babylonians are doing these things as well. Habakkuk has some questions. Number one, God, God, why are you not interacting? God, why are you letting all this wickedness happen? And the answer is, Habakkuk, you don't even know what I'm doing. And if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe me. And then he starts to tell him, I'm going to use the Chaldeans to discipline Judah. And he kind of struggles with that idea. So I think that kind of validates what God was saying. You, you, you won't even understand all the providence that I have going on. Then we have the second question of Habakkuk. How could you, God, use a wicked nation to punish a nation that is also doing bad things but is not as wicked as the other nation? And I think the answer is, is everyone will be judged. Is that not only Judah is going to answer for the things that are going on, but Babylon will also answer for the things that are going to be done. So we have questions and answers, and then we get to chapter 3. In chapter 3, Habakkuk starts a prayer. And when we start to read down through this prayer, we're not going to read everything word for word, but once you get down to verses 3 uh, and you, 3 through 13, really it's a recap of all the things that God has done. But to start out, we, we see that uh, in verse 2, he starts the prayer. In verse 2, he says, O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. You know, that word actually has tremble associated with it. It's Habakkuk says, God, I've heard what you've said about Judah. I've heard what you said about Babylon, and it makes me afraid. I am trembling. And I think one of the problems that we have in our nation today is people don't tremble at the words of God anymore. It's like they, they don't think that God cares. They don't think that God's acting in the world, and because of that, they act in a certain way. But God does care about the way that we conduct ourselves upon this world and this physical life. And you know what? When we read about God's punishment, it should make us tremble. It should make us consider our life and what we're doing. It made Habakkuk tremble. He says, I've heard what you said, God, about all of this that's going to happen, and I am afraid. I am trembling. What a fearful thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. The people tremble at the words of God anymore. As his prayer continues, verses 3 through uh, 13... He recalls God's past work. He remembers how God brought them out of Egypt, how God has helped them along the way, how God has helped the, the, uh, the Israelites. In verse 13 it says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare the foundation to the neck. Basically, verses 3 through 13, if I was going to summarize them, Habakkuk is reflecting on how God has dealt with nations, how God has helped Israel, God's people, how he has led them out of Egypt, how he's helped them, how he's been there. And he also understands that God has been dealing with nations all along the way. And I think once he gets to the tail end of 13, he's reflecting and he's realizing that God is going to punish Judah. Well, what was his question to start the book? God, are you ever going to punish Judah? How long will you wait? Will you ever punish them for, for the injustice, for the violence, for, for the disregard of the law? Will you ever, God? And I think at chapter 3, when he's in this prayer, he's realizing that God has been working on this the whole time. His providence has been at hand. He's been raising the Chaldeans as a, a disciplinary tool. And, you know, when you think of discipline, that's something that's been totally, I feel like, corrupted by our society. You know, when you think about discipline, discipline is a very important thing that we all need in our lives. In fact, in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6, it says the Lord loves who he disciplines. Think about that. The Lord loves who he disciplines. When you discipline your children or you discipline your grandchildren, are you really doing it because you hate them? No, you're doing it because you love them. You're doing it because you love them. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 12 says the same thing. The Lord loves who he disciplines. It says chastens, I believe, in Proverbs. But, you know, I think back on my life and all the times that my parents stepped in and disciplined me. You know, I look back and I reflect, and you oftentimes hear this, is, is sometimes you look back and not only are you thankful for the discipline, but typically you'll say something else. I wish they would have disciplined me more. 
Sometimes, I mean, I, I think people do reflect on that. I am thankful for the time my parents stepped in and disciplined me. And I think even though this looks extremely harsh, what's God doing? He's doing it so that they will come to their senses. They are doing wicked things. They are disregarding laws. They are being violent to one another. There's death. There's, there's killing. There's a lot of things that are going on. And God is trying to wake them up and say, come back to me. Live a life in accordance to my will. Discipline is a very important part of life. You start to look at this situation, you start to read down through it, and it kind of amazes you because I think it really ends with just such a great statement of faith. Once we get to the tail end of the prayer, they call it a hymn of faith. Some people uh, have labeled it as, but you get to verses 17 through 19, which is what Mickey read for us, and you read this and you realize the, the conclusions that Habakkuk is coming to. Let's read those verses. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines. Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on high hills." Seems like once he gets to the conclusion of his prayer, Habakkuk is accepting the situation that he's in. You know where Habakkuk's at? I mean, he's in Judah. He's right in the area that's going to be taken over and brought into captivity. And it's almost like Habakkuk is saying to God, God, it does not matter what happens. It doesn't matter if there's no food. It doesn't matter if there's no possessions. It doesn't matter if there's no wealth. At the end of the day, God, I am with you. It doesn't matter what happens. Whatever discipline comes on Judah, I will remain faithful to you. And you think about some of these things that he describes. These are things that we would expect to always be there. The fig tree may not blossom. Even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, I will be faithful to you, God. Even if there's no, no herds in the stalls, I will be faithful to you, God. It doesn't matter what happens. In the world around me, I will stay faithful to you. Not only will he stay faithful, but he will keep his joy. And when you think about the situation that Habakkuk falls into, you think for a second, someone who's standing right on the cusp of the Babylonians coming in and destroying and taking all these people into captivity to say that, God, I'm with you no matter what happens, that's quite a statement. You know, we might be put to the test someday in respect to that. Perhaps God will use some nation to discipline America in some way and we'll be caught in that crossfire. Will you stay faithful to God? No matter what happens, if you get caught in that crossfire. That's where Habakkuk finds himself and he says, God, I will be faithful to you. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. God is a forgiving God, but he is also a God of justice. And that's something that we must always consider. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. We ask you to please come as we stand and as we sing.